Hello everyone, in this video we are going to discuss a method for estimating the temperature T inside a star given only two parameters of the star, specifically its mass M and its radius R. Now our goal in this video is not to develop some super detailed model of the interior structure of a star, but rather to keep the physics and maths involved fairly simple and see how good an estimate we can get. So of course we're going to have to make a couple of simplifying assumptions about the star. Um, in particular, we are going to assume that both the density and the temperature of the star are uniform. In other words, density and temperature don't vary with position within the star. Now, of course, these are not quite true for a real star. So real stars are both denser and hotter at their core compared with in their outer regions. But as we'll see at the end, uh, this simple model is actually surprisingly effective. So the method we're going to use is an energy-based method. And the key idea is that when we have a cloud of gas and dust that collapses to form a star, it releases lots of gravitational potential energy, right? It starts with close to zero gravitational potential energy. And as it gets more and more compact, uh, it's gravitational potential energy becomes negative. Now that gravitational potential energy that's released has to go somewhere and we're going to assume that all of the released GPE becomes the thermal energy of the star. So then our first goal is to come up with expressions for both the GPE of a star and the thermal energy of a star in terms of the stellar parameters. So first of all to estimate the gravitational potential energy of the star we are going to model the star as a sphere radius capital R and we're going to split it up into lots of spherical shells. So that's what I've indicated on my diagram. I've drawn some arbitrary spherical shell with radius lowercase r and thickness dr, a small increment in r. We're essentially going to imagine constructing the star, building it up from zero radius up to its final radius capital R um, by adding these spherical shells one by one and adding up all of the little changes in gravitational potential energy that you get when you add each successive um, layer of material. Now mathematically this idea of summing up lots of small changes in something is doing an integral, right? And so the first thing I'm going to do um, is say that the gravitational potential energy Eg is the integral of DEG, which is basically just saying we're adding together lots of small increments in EG. Now we just need to rewrite the integrand in a way that allows us to, well, actually do the integral. Um, and so what we're going to do is use the fact that gravitational potential energy is gravitational potential multiplied by mass, right? Now, gravitational potential is minus GM over R. So that's the gravitational potential of an arbitrary sphere with a mass of small m um, and a radius of small r. We have to be careful to interpret the meanings of the symbols correctly in the context of this problem. So here, uh, lowercase r, as I introduced earlier, is just the radius of our arbitrary spherical shell. Lowercase m is the mass contained within that spherical shell, right? So this is like the gravitational potential um, at the surface of the star by the time we've built it up to a radius of lowercase r. Then to turn that gravitational potential into a gravitational potential energy, all we have to do is multiply by the mass that is coming in. The mass that's coming in is the infinitesimal mass of the next spherical shell that we're adding, and so it would make sense to call that infinitesimal mass dm. So I would say conceptually that's the hardest bit of this problem already done. Now we just have to run through all the actual maths. So let's see how we're going to do this integral. Um, well, we've got an R here, but we're integrating with respect to M. So we better write our M and our DM in terms of R. Um, so this is going to be the integral of, um, you've still got, okay, minus G over R. Let's keep that in front. Um, what are we going to do about this M? Well, assuming that the star has uniform density, we can say that the mass enclosed within radius lowercase r, which is density times volume, and the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds um, pi r cubed. So 4 thirds pi r cubed times the density rho, which we're assuming to be uniform. Then what are we going to do about the small increment in mass dm? Well, we can also use the fact, again, that mass is density times volume. The volume here is not the volume of a sphere, but the volume of a spherical shell, which is 4 pi r squared times dr. And so that dm is going to be 4 pi r squared rho dr. So let's make this look a bit nicer by collecting together all the constant terms and bringing them out the front of the integral. Um, you are going to have a numerical factor of minus 16 pi squared over 3. You've also got a constant big G um, and you've got two factors of density, so you've got rho squared. Um, and so the integral itself is just going to be the integral of what power of r do we have? We've got r cubed, r squared, and then divided by r. So r to the 4 with respect to r. We better put some limits on as well. Limits are pretty straightforward because, again, we're building up our star from zero radius up to its final radius, capital R. Then when you do the integral, you just get capital R to the 5 over 5, and you put it all together, and so our overall expression is minus 16 pi squared 
over 15 because the 3 has been multiplied by 5 on the bottom. Then you've got g rho squared uh, big R to the 5. What I'd like to do now is express this row in terms of capital M and capital R because those were the parameters I provided in the problem at the beginning, right? So we're going to keep much of this expression the same. We're going to keep our minus 16 pi squared over 15 g at the beginning. What are we going to do about the row squared? Well, again, density is mass over volume. So density squared is mass squared over volume squared. The mass squared part is easy. It's just capital M squared. Then we have to divide that by volume squared. So again, volume, the volume of the star overall is 4 thirds pi times capital R cubed. We square that, we get 16 pi squared r to the 6 over 9, and then we're going to flip that upside down because we are dividing by the volume instead of multiplying by volume. And so you're going to have that multiplied by 9 over 16 pi squared r to the 6. And then you've got this r to the 5, um, which is still there at the end. Then lots of things cancel and it simplifies really nicely to minus three fifths of g m squared over capital R, which you can easily see is dimensionally consistent with being an energy. So there's our expression for gravitational potential energy. How about the expression for thermal energy? Well, let's come up with one, ET, let's call it. We're going to use the equipartition theorem, which tells us um, that the average energy of a particle in the star is 3 over 2 times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature in the star. Um, so we just have to take that and multiply it by, let's call it n particles, the total number of particles that are moving around in the star. So then let's keep the three halves kt as it is, um, and we need to deal with this n particles, express it in terms of the parameters of the original problem. Well, let's pretend that the star is purely made of hydrogen. In other words, there hasn't been any fusion at all um, that's created heavier elements. So we have a pure hydrogen star. Um, if the star only contained hydrogen atoms, the number of those hydrogen atoms um, would be the total mass of the star divided by the mass of one hydrogen atom. Let's just call it mh. Now, in reality, the temperature in the star is going to be so hot that the hydrogen atoms will be ionized. And so the electrons are separate from the nuclei of the hydrogen atoms. And so we should really multiply this by two to account for the fact that those electrons have been separated. We have twice as many particles as we sort of thought we did. And this is kind of okay to do because the mass of an electron is negligible compared with the mass of a proton, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Then, of course, the twos cancel and you just get three kT times big M over mass of a hydrogen atom. So you've got your two expressions for the GPE and the thermal energy. What are we actually going to do with them? Well, we're going to use the principle of conservation of energy and say that the initial energy of the cloud of gas and dust before it collapsed is equal to the final energy um, of the star, which you know was formed from that collapsing cloud. Now, the final energy is easy to write down an expression for. It's just the sum of those two types of energies, right? E.g plus ET. We're going to equate that to the initial energy and we're going to say that the initial energy was zero and the reason is that we're assuming that the cloud from which the star formed was diffuse so that the particles are far apart from each other and didn't have much GPE and also cold the temperature was much lower to start with than it was at the end and so both the gravitational potential and the thermal energies are negligible compared with uh, those of the star. We are of course ignoring a couple of other forms of energy here. For example, you might be wondering, do we have to take into account the ionization energy of the hydrogen atoms? Because they will have initially been atoms. And at some point when the temperature got hot enough, the electrons would have split off and they would have been ionized. So I did a quick calculation just to uh, get a sense of how big that ionization energy was in total. And I found that it was about 100 times less than the GPE. And so uh, we could include it, but it's going to have a negligible effect on our answer. So anyway, the conservation of energy equation implies, of course, that three fifths of gm squared over r uh, is equal to 3 kt big m over mh then the threes cancel and one of the m's cancels from each side and you rearrange it for t you find that temperature is approximately gm mh divided by 5 k r remember by the way that we're using quite a simple model here so this is really just an order of magnitude estimate and this numerical factor of five shouldn't be taken too seriously the actual numerical prefactor that you get if you do the full calculation is probably not just a five so there's no deep physical meaning there so of course to finish off we want to check how good this estimate of the temperature actually is so if we plug in the stellar parameters for the sun the mass of the sun and the radius of the sun um, we find that the estimate of the temperature is about five times 10 to the power of 6 Kelvin. Now this is actually really good when you consider that the actual core temperature in the sun 
is about 10 to the 7 Kelvin. It does make sense physically that the answer that we've got is a bit smaller than the core temperature of the sun, because remember we assumed that everything was uniform, and so what we've got is really some sort of average temperature throughout the sun. So maybe partially we just got lucky that the model happened to give us a number that's very close to an actual physically sensible number, but I always find it really interesting when these uh, simple calculations um, lead to surprisingly accurate answers. Anyway, thank you for joining me, hope you've enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.